Houston Racing with what's called Key Production right here. That's Joe Cogswell in the yellow car. He's from Norcross leading the black Nissan of Watts Vets as they go into the final lap. Lots of excitement. Here they come. Oh, my. They're into the tire wall. Cars rolling over. Nobody's injured in this. Shaking up a little bit. Last turn, last lap. If I could have only made it down the hill. But the kill switch was pinned to the roll bar and the car wouldn't go anywhere. Oh well, fast forward 30 years and here we are to tell you the information on how to build your 356 motor properly. What we're going to learn today is how do you know how many copper shims to put under the base of your cylinder to build your 356 or Porsche 912 motor. Today that's what we're going to teach you is how to calculate your compression ratio and we're also going to teach you how to measure the distance between the piston and the cylinder head to make sure that the piston is not going to smack the head and that you have enough room for proper flame travel and will not have ignition ping on the fuels that are made today which when you look at the premium pump at your local gas station that is a maximum rating not a minimum rating so you need to have a motor that will run on today's pump gas hello this is Joe Cogbill and these are the tools that you're going to need to check the piston to cylinder head clearance as well as calculate the compression ratio to make a decision on how many shims to place under the cylinders at the base of the cylinders of your Porsche 356 or 912 engine rebuild. We're going to need a barrette. This is the smallest one they make. It's made of plastic. It works great. It's only about $25. Uh, you big money guys could go buy you a 50 or 100 milliliter barrette. Uh, this one I have to fill five times to do the CCs. You can get the larger one if you like, but this $25 one will look, work just fine. Play-Doh, of course, from Dollar General. Rosin Core Solder crushes better than solid solder and you need a micrometer to make your measurements so these are the tools that we're going to need for this exercise to calculate how to assemble your 356 or 912 motor Hello, this is Joe Cogbill with you, and we are still assembling a 1964 356 C engine. In this case, for the customer, we have gone with the Wastner piston. It's only a millimeter overbore. You see, it's a very nice piece. It actually has a high silicon content in the metal. Uh, it has a nice silicon skirt, has very thin rings. The top ring's very thin, so very little drag. Nice piston. But we really don't know quite what the compression ratio is. So, how much space is in between that piston and the cylinder head? We know the volume of the cylinder at first oversize is going to be 404 cc's. You have a 1600 cc motor. You're going to go from 82.5 to 83 millimeter. So we're gonna be in the first oversize so we know our cylinder volume will be 404. What I'm gonna do now is show you how to by installing one piston and two jugs and then we're going to take some play-doh and a little rosin core solder and we're going to measure the deck height of the piston and then we're going to cc the engine so that we can figure out how many copper shims 
go under each cylinder. Each copper shim is worth 1.4 cc's. This is actually the Volkswagen 83 millimeter ring squeezer. Pretty handy, pretty cheap. There are a lot more expensive ones on the market since we are gonna go basically from 82 and a half to 83, it fits perfectly. I'm going to install both jugs, actually just one piston, but both jugs to make sure that the head bolts on evenly and we will get an accurate measurement. For this measurement exercise, we've gotten a little bit of Play-Doh from the Dollar General, and this is rosin coarse solder. It has rosin in the middle. It just squishes easier than solid core. Uh, then we've moved the piston just below top dead center. Now we're gonna lay some rosin coarse solder on top of the piston and put some Play-Doh on it just to hold it in place. Okay, we've got our rosin core solder in place. I measured it before I put it in there. It's about 90 thousandths thick. We're gonna do this in inches because that's what's in my head. Uh, be sure and extend the, if it's gonna hit the piston, if the piston's gonna hit the head, it'll do it more out at the edge than it will in the middle, of course. So be sure and run your solder all the way out to the edge and then just a little bit of Play-Doh to hold it in place. So here's our cylinder head. See that we've had a valve job performed. Also, there's been machine work done to the head. Uh, one thing that you need to notice right here is where the CC stamps would be. Usually would be 60 or 61 CCs. That is the measured volume of this area. Uh, now it has been barely machined, probably fly cut right here. We really don't know the history of the head. That's why we are going through this exercise to make sure that we're not going to have too much compression and that the piston is not too close to the cylinder head. The space of the cylinder head washers needs to be accounted for, so you always need to check. Just take a little magnet. Make sure you've got no hidden head washers in here. That will definitely ruin your valve train geometry and things won't fit right. We've tightened down our cylinder head, just hand tight, because this is just for a test, and only the four head bolts over that cylinder. Now I'm gonna take my 30 millimeter wrench and squish the solder, and you can feel it resist. I only make it squish once. I don't wanna do it twice. I think it'll give it a faulty reading. Okay, I've measured my solder. I have one piece that's down to 43 thousandths of an inch. It's going to smack the piston at 38 thousandths of an inch, so I would be immediately inclined to stick another shim under the jug of all four cylinders on this motor, as uh, that's only five thousandths of an inch from smacking the piston, smacking the head. Also, when you get the pistons too close to the head, 
Your flame travel does not propagate. We used to carve pathways in the race pistons to make the flame travel come down to the lower side of the piston since we're a single ignition and the spark plugs up here. So putting the motor too close, even though it will get you compression, it actually will lose power because it runs into what we call the wall where it won't pump. It's just really a big compressor that has gasoline put to it and a spark from the spark plug and it will not pump and won't be efficient if you put it up too close. So now we're going to measure the cc's of the motor. So now we're going to find out what the volume of the cylinder head is so that we can do the math for the compression ratio and know what we have. I've left it just like it is. We have one copper shim under the jug. I've put a good line of grease to where the rings will stop oil, which is I'm using a light oil. You want to come up and find exactly top dead center. So, we'll put it right on the mark. And then wipe away any excess grease so that you get an accurate reading for your CC's calculation. Okay, we're getting ready to CC our motor. We make absolutely sure we're on top dead center. Spark plug hole is up. I have a very simple, I believe this is used in many things. You don't need a fancy way to calculate this. This hold 10 cc's at a time. I'm going to drop the fluid into the spark plug hole until the lake of fluid comes right up to where the base of the spark plug would be and then we'll see how many cc's we have in the cylinder head area okay we have used our little barrette and continued to pour fluid in the spark plug hole. So far I've put 50 cc's of oil in here. It is okay to move your engine stand back and forth a little bit to burp whatever air bubble may be in there uh, so that you get an accurate reading. But be real careful right near the end that you don't overdo it and go past the base of the hole where the spark plug would end. Okay, so we've reached uh, the bottom of the spark plug hole. That's why 50 cc's is a good time to kind of check yourself and be real careful on the last bit of cc's. This one ended up being 53.3 cc's with one copper shim under the jug on top dead center. So we will go calculate the math and bring that back to you. And let's see where we're going to end up with this motor and how many shims under the cylinders we're going to run to have plenty of room for the piston and still try to maintain as much compression as we can, uh, or maybe in some cases, not too much compression. Okay, now we have calculated our cc's with our barrette. We ended up with 53.3 cc's. And now we're going to do our formula. So the formula for compression ratio is volume 1 plus volume 2 divided by volume 2 gives you your compression ratio. 
Of course, we got the 404 cc's through math, but it's pretty simple. As you know, you have a 1600 cc motor, and now we bored it 40 thousandths of an inch, and that's where we get, by math, the 404 cc's. And by measurement, we measured that the cylinder head volume with the piston all the way up is 53.3 cc's. And you divide, add those two together, divided by itself 53.3, this motor with one shim has 8.579 to one. I will be adding a shim to this motor. And this is the math you go by for each shim is 1.4 cc's on this size motor. We've calculated that one math. If I add one shim under the cylinder, I'll bump it up from 53.3 to 50.4.7 cc's, and now I will have a compression ratio of basically 8.4 to 1. This is a little disappointing, but I need the space because I only have 43 thousandths of an inch between the piston and the head. The heads have been cut. I cannot add any material to speak of to make it greater to raise the compression, but in the life of the motor, as it carbons up, it'll probably pick up two or three tenths of a point and get more up near 8.7 to one. But this is how you check to see how many copper shims you need, each of them being 10,000 thick, under the cylinders of your 356 or 912 motor and that way you can determine what the safe deck height for the piston is and what your compression ratio is by knowing these two things. So now we're going to end our little production here with a video of me winning my last national championship. I was very fortunate in the 18 years that I raced my 356 Speedster to have won three national championships. I was three-time runner-up, probably had some of the best times of my life. Enjoy this video. Without Paul Spruill to defend his championship, a field of 24 e-production cars were eager to take his place. The pace was set by last year's runner-up, Bob Stutter, number 79, of Tennille, Georgia, when he qualified his Datsun Roadster under the e-production track record. Beside him sat the Dotson Roaster of Rock Best, number 38 of Louisville, North Carolina. When the green flag was shown, Best was first through turn number one, followed by a loose stutter, and third place, Joe Cogville, number 96 of North Cross, Georgia. At the end of the first lap, stutter was first, but was overtaken by Cogville in turn one. On the next lap, Cogville was first and best a distant second as Stuttered and the fourth and fifth qualifiers had been knocked out of the running. Cogville and Best were locked in a struggle for the top spot and began to pull away from the pack. Eighth place qualifier Vic Skirmance, number 70 of Warren, Michigan, had assumed third. He was soon challenged by 10th qualifier Jack Wheeler, number 11 of Columbus, Indiana. Skirmitz held on with Wheeler on his tail until Wheeler found an opening and took third at the start of lap number five. Cogville and Best had moved there side by side and nose to tail battle for the lead out of sight of the third place scramble. Skirmitz regained third from Wheeler on lap six. Best finally got by Cogville on lap seven to take the lead. The Black Lotus of Jerry Hinkle, number 66 of Maryland, had steadily regained the positions he had lost on the second lap and was up to fifth. The leaders touched metal to metal lap turn number five. 
Cogbill pulled inside best at the bridge and resumed the lead to take the $1,000 bonus for leading on lap number nine. the Georgia Clay momentarily in the wild battle for the lead. Both leaders got the furled black flag for playing bumper cars. Wheeler passed Skirmis for third place on lap number 14 as Hinkle retired with a flat tire. Skirmis retook third and the positions held to the checker. Joe Cogbill III claimed the E-Production National Championship with a two-tenths of a second margin over second place Rock Fest. Nick Sturman, I can't slow down. 